So I'm going to be uh, chewing at an old bone of mine, which is who gets to decide what psychedelic experiences mean? So my question, and my provocative question, it's deliberately provocative to try and get bums on seats. Thank you for falling for it. <laughs> are psychedelic experiences really ineffable? Lots of people think that they are. Here's some heavy duty books that you may uh, have read or may not. In uh, The Amazing Philosophy in Psychedelics, the collection that came out uh, last year, at least four chapters talk about ineffability as one of the essential uh, components of the psychedelic experience. Chris Lefby's Philosophy in Psychedelics. I could go on and on, but going all the way back to the 1960s, the varieties of psychedelic experience. All foreground ineffability, the uh, inability to put into words what has been experienced or possibly not being able to convey in words to someone who hasn't had the experience. Um, this is a key component in a lot of the scientific research that's going on at the moment, particularly at Johns Hopkins University, but elsewhere, where if you, if you want to demonstrate that change has occurred, you have to turn a qualitative experience into something quantitative, and they do that through scales, through questionnaires, through measurement scales. Uh, this one's rather out of date, the Hood Mysticism Scale. Some people still use it. Uh, this is the one that most people use, the Mystical Experience Questionnaire. And it expressly asks you, have you had an experience that is ineffable with these three questions here? So ineffability has become diagnostic. It's become diagnostic. Look at my visual aid here. I work hard for you guys. <laughs> on the old Google image search. Uh, it's become diagnostic of a certain kind of psychedelic experience. It means that a, an apotheosis has occurred, the mystical experience. And currently, that seems to be the be all and end all. That's the peak. That's what we're all aiming for. Uh-huh. So uh, I'm going to start off with some glib responses to this, and then I'm going to get stuck into some more heavy-duty objections to ineffability. I should just point out, right, if you've had an experience that for you was ineffable and you want to describe it as ineffable, I do not have a problem with that. That is indubitably true for you. I'm asking a different question. William James, who we will see started this whole thing off, admitted that lots of things in life are ineffable, like the experience of listening to a great piece of music or the experience of falling in love. I thought of one more, the smell of your lover's unwashed armpit. Can you put that into words? I bet you can't. It's quite difficult. A bit fruity, a bit musky. I mean, it doesn't really capture it. Many things are ineffable, doesn't mean that they point to a mystical experience. Um, Michel Foucault, in his History of Sexuality, Volume 1, uh, questions the idea that the Victorians were prudish and repressed about sex. He says, no, 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 what the Victorians did, they invented a whole proliferation of ways of talking about sex. In the same way, this experience that is supposed to be ineffable uh, we are just inventing more and more ways of talking about this experience, whether that be 5-HT2A and agonists, or uh, levels 0 to 5, or breakthrough experiences, or integration, or plant spirits, self-transforming machine elves. We have conferences of three days where people just talk about this stuff. This is a glib response, but we're, we're proliferating the ways in which we talk about psychedelic experiences. Now, I'm a scholar of religion, and I want to understand psychedelic phenomenology. That's my aim. I want to know what's going on when people are tripping. But I want to ask the question, how is it that ineffability or effability became the question that you ask? 
of people when they've had a psychedelic experience. It's not the case in other cultures. In Gabon, if you go and do your Bawiti initiation, what matters is that your soul has left its body and traveled to the realm of the ancestors. That is not a question on the mystical experience questionnaire. The question that matters is whether you can put it into words or not. So how, how did this happen? How did we get to a stage where that was the question to ask? Secondly, I want to ask whether people actually mean the same thing when they use the word ineffability. And I'm going to suggest there are varieties of ineffability. And then if that's not the right question to ask, what is the right question to ask? We good? Okay, how did it become a reasonable question to ask? This doesn't take a lot of digging. It goes back to William James and his famous point model of mystical experience. This is religious studies 101. Uh, the four characteristics of the mystical experience, they are passive, ineffable, noetic, transient. And he makes ineffability and noesis uh, the, the two most important defining features of the mystical experience. I'll, if there's time, I'll go into why he wanted to do this. This ball was taken up by British philosopher Walter Terence Stace uh, in his 1960 book, Mysticism and Philosophy, which, <clears throat> for at least American scientific research, seems to be the kind of be-all and end-all when it comes to talking about mystical experience. Now, Stace, Stace makes a distinction between extroverted mystical experience, which is what we might call nature mystical experience, and introverted mystical experience. I reuse this photo on the, on the left a lot. I really should ask her permission. She was my girlfriend back in the 1990s. <laughs> but she, 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 we, we weren't having an extroverted mystical experience. We were having an absolutely horrendous encounter with an army helicopter at Avebury, but that's another story. <laughs> <laughs> we were curled up in a hedge. Like this. But anyway, so the extroverted is all about oneness with the world, whereas introverted is more about some kind of in interior unity, some unitary consciousness, some experience of pure, unreflective consciousness. There's, there's, um, there's just a sense of oneness. And these are Stace's features. And we do, there's not time to go through them all, but notice the alleged ineffability. That's a key factor. Walter Pankey, uh, in the 19, early 1960s, performed the famous Marsh Chapel uh, experiment where he wanted to see whether you could measure whether people taking psilocybin had a, um, a, a statistically significant, more mystical experience than people who had a placebo. Sorry, that was a very uh, long-winded way of putting it. Um, he gave a load of theology graduates and students uh, placebo or psilocybin and then put them in a church service and wanted to measure whether those on the, um, who got the dose had a more mystical time than those that didn't. Much debated and there isn't time to go into that experiment but he needed a way of empirically measuring that and he came up with the mystical experience questionnaire or the questions that became the mystical experience questionnaire. And for that he looked expressly to Stace and to um, William James, for whom these provided a solid ground upon which he could build this questionnaire. So all those features were built into his questionnaire. Okay, so there's high stakes here. The first high stake is that ever since the Enlightenment, um, European culture, modern culture, has, been, has lost its faith. God is dead, Nietzsche said. We have killed him. If mysticism is true, if the mystical experience is demonstrably true, that provides a ground for religious belief, for religious faith. If psychedelics give you access to mystical experience, then they are no longer psychedelics, they are entheogens. They are tools to give you a mystical experience that has ontological veracity. So there's high stakes here. This is a sort of European... Oh my God, does God exist or not? You know, we're in the, we're in the void, the post-Darwinian void, the post-Freudian void. 
Now, both William James and, and Walter Stace were struggling theists. If you read the varieties of religious experience and you don't just read the drug chapter and read the whole book and you get to the last page, the last page is the most interesting bit because James grabs the reader by the lapels and he uses this word bosh. He says, he's basically going, I, I need to believe. This whole book has been about me struggling with my belief. And because people have weird experiences and non-ordinary experiences, that's good enough for me. I can be an, a, a rationalist and an imp, an, uh, um, empiricist. But all these weird experiences prove to me that God is real. That's kind of what he's saying. Stace also um, was a devout Christian in his youth, was going to become a priest, was dissuaded from that course by his parents. He joined the civil service. He lost his faith in a personal loving God. And it's only late in life that he got interested in mysticism again. And so again, his work is actually him coming to terms with wanting to believe in something. And it's no longer a personal loving God. It's pure consciousness for Stace. So, Stace has undergone, within the humanities, sustained critiques for his methods. He was partial in his uh, uh, treatment of sources. Uh, he was very narrow in his treatment of sources. He often read mystics in translation. He often used really shit translations. Um, and he's been critiqued for that. And also, he just ignored a whole suite of experiences that accompany the mystical experience in the classic accounts of mysticism. These include feelings of loving the world or feeling loved by something. He didn't talk about that. Uh, paranormal experiences, the stuff that gets David Luke out of bed in the morning. Uh, <laughs> mystical experiences are... Uh, <laughs> well, you know what I mean. Uh, <laughs> mystical experiences are often accompanied by weird shit and he left the weird shit out. He wasn't interested in the weird shit. They're often accompanied by psychosis. Here I'm drawing particularly on Paul Marshall's excellent book here. Um, sorry, this looks like I'm trying to cancel him. I'm not trying to... <laughs> Swipe left! Well, the, the, the point I'm trying to make here is that um, Stace does not offer the secure and stable ground for a conversation about mysticism. But that information doesn't seem to have fed back from the humanities into the sciences as yet. And I speak, so I used to be a scientist. I'm a recovering scientist. And then I, <laughs> I moved into the humanities. OK, that was my first question. How did, so I've answered the question, how did we get to the point where that was a reasonable question to ask. First of all, William James and then Stace. And I think it's because he was working in Princeton University that the fact that he was in America, I think that counted. My next question, do people actually mean the same thing when they say they've had an ineffable experience? And I'm going to suggest to you today that not necessarily. There are varieties of ineffability. Social, what I'm calling social ineffability something to do with deficiencies of language, and then finally metaphysical ineffability. There may be metaphysical reasons why it's not possible to speak about what you've experienced. So let's go through these. And I'm sorry I'm gabbling a bit, but we don't get much time here. Well, the first reason is you might not be allowed to talk about your experiences. It might be taboo. This has got nothing to do with the experience itself and everything to do with the social context in which that experience has occurred. So, for example, uh, initiates of um, the Bawiti religion can't talk about a lot of what happens during that ceremony. It's taboo. You're not allowed to do it. So someone might be saying this experience was ineffable because they can't talk about it. Same is true of the ancient Greek mysteries. You are not supposed to talk about them. That's why they're mysteries. Secondly, it might be a kind of, I mean, this is a very English uh, uh, point to make. It's all about self-deprecation. Um, if you start off by saying, well, I can't possibly put this into words, but then this UFO landed in front of me and aliens came out, you're actually saying, you're deflecting criticism. 
It's a way of, of setting up what you're going to say and putting it beyond criticism or beyond analysis. Don't blame me, Governor. I just haven't got the words for it. You know, I can't. Which is understandable when we live in a, we live in a world where you can't routinely talk about your UFO experiences or your ferry encounters unless you're here. <laughs> it may not denote anything at all. It may be about what it connotes. It may not be saying, I can't put it into words. It may just be a trope, a flag, a way of saying this experience was significant in some culturally agreed way. And it's often the case, isn't it, that when people say, I couldn't possibly put this into words, and you're there half an hour later, as, you know, <laughs> right, okay, thank you. <laughs> Just have a look at the trip reports. You know, and it's the same is true of the mystical literature. People say, can't possibly put this into words, but I felt this, you know, and then on they go for pages. So that's what I call social ineffability. Then there may be something wrong with language. Language is fixed. It has rules of grammar. It's, um, you know, once you've written something, it can't move. It's not like a piece of improvised jazz. Uh, it's stuck. So it may not be the right tool for the job because the trip is something that's unfolding. It's constantly moving. It's um, surprising in a way that a sentence can't necessarily be surprising. There may be a problem of metaphor, which is, with metaphor, we take something concrete and we apply it to something abstract. But it's not entirely clear what the, what the psychedelic experience is like. And, and here's where, you know, we need the poets, right? And we need the, the novelists to come up with new and exciting metaphors. Um, one of the most enduring metaphors, the trip. It's a journey. There's a there and back again journey. But it's not easy. It's why a lot of psychedelic literature is frankly not very good. And it's interesting that people in other, working in other media, don't ever say, oh, you know, you don't get psychedelic musicians going, you know what, I had a trip. I just had nothing to play. You know, psychedelic music, has just burgeoned and explodes and continues to go off in a million different directions. Think of all the visual art that's done. Compare those sort of um, uh, oil blob things that Pink Floyd used to have in the 60s to the immersive VR psychedelic experiences we have now. You don't get visual artists going, well, no, I've got nothing to paint. Oh. By which I mean language just might not, and particularly I'm talking about written language here, might not be the right tool for the job. Uh, and I just throw this in uh, because, uh, and I, I'm naive, I've never had a 5-MEO DMT experience, but uh, people say it is the most difficult to put into words, and yet Peter here has managed to put it into words. <laughs> so maybe it's not so much a deficiency of language, but a deficiency in our ability to deploy language. I'm channeling uh, the spirit of Robert Graves. Then. And then finally and briefly, um, metaphysical ineffability. I'm just going to talk about two different ways in which the psychedelic experience or the mystical experience might be ineffable for m metaphysical reasons. And the first, I mean, there are library angels. Everyone knows there's library angels. I was here in Exeter with my family. And I pleaded with them after a day in the museum, great museum here, strongly recommend a visit. Can I just have a quick look in the Oxfam bookshop? And they agreed. And I looked at the theology section, and my hand alighted on this book, this wonderful book, uh, published in 94. So this argument comes from Michael Sell's Mystical Languages of Unsaying, to which my hand was beautifully guided but six weeks ago. Uh, Plotinus, the uh, uh, Neoplatonic philosopher of late antiquity. For Plotinus, everything stems from a single transcendent principle. But the problem with language is that words by necessity limit. So you have something that is limitless, and I'm trying to contain it in words. That's an impossibility. It's a logical impossibility 
of language. Even to call it limitless or a transcendent principle is to limit it. Hence, anything that you say, which is what Plotinus called cataphasis, must be immediately unsaid, apophasis. This is the start of the apophatic tradition. Very, very long. You can look at the list of names there on the book. Master Eckhart, Ibn Arabi, hugely influential, the, um, the Platinian apophatic tradition. So things can't be spoken about because the principle you're trying to describe is transcendent and you would limit it. Walter Stace didn't like this very much and he demolishes this idea in his book, but he comes up with a different metaphysical ineffability. Remember that the essence of the mystical experience for Stace is this experience of pure, unmediated, unreflective consciousness. There is simply nothing there to which words would stick. It's devoid of anything. It's just pure consciousness. Words can't get purchase on this. Subsequently, he says, mystics then try and record their remembered experiences, and then this is why he calls it alleged ineffability. So while they're having the experience, it is ineffable because it is beyond anything. There's, there's, it's just pure consciousness. Um, afterwards, they recall their, their experiences, and then they fall into the same problems of language that I've talked about. Now, these are two different metaphysical reasons for ineffability. They're not quite the same. There may be others. So when someone says they've had an experience that is ineffable, we need to know, is it for reasons of social ine ineffability, because of deficiencies of language, or because they're putting forward a certain metaphysics? Why does any of this matter? Remember, I'm a scholar of religion and I want to understand psychedelic phenomenology. Um, it matters because this, asking people these questions, is shit ethnography. It's the first thing you're taught when you learn ethnography is not to put answers into your informants' heads. Let them speak in their own words. We shouldn't be forcing categories upon our informants. Because think of all the stuff we're going to miss out. If we just focus on this one thing, ineffability, I could give you countless examples. Let me just give you one. A dear old friend of mine who was there back in the 60s, hanging out with the incredible string band, took LSD in Amsterdam in the 1960s, and this was the trip that he said made him give up psychedelics. Because, he said, he was propelled into this infinite space throughout which there was just an infinite, infinite number of Buddhas all radiating pure, malevolent, evil towards him. And he realized at that point, he was out of his depth. <laughs> we would miss an experience that it wasn't ineffable, it was ghastly. We may be, whether we like it or not, forcing a metaphysics upon our informant. Uh, Peter in the philosophy um, panel yesterday was saying, we really need to know what our metaphysic is. We've all got an implicit metaphysics, whether we like it or not, whether we've studied metaphysics, it doesn't matter. We're all coming at this with a metaphysical position. And if we're just putting forward Stacian metaphysics because that's what everyone else is doing, do you really think that there's the be all and end all is pure consciousness? If you do, great, I don't have a problem with it, but be explicit about it and don't lay that on your informants. We're silencing marginalized voices. I'm always, always about who gets marginalized, who gets silenced. And it's the indigenous voices, always, that get silenced. I've already said these are not questions that habitually get asked in indigenous contexts. Um, yeah, you know. Uh, if a plant spirit appears, what do they look like? What were they, how were they dressed? What did they say? What was their manner? And so on. Again, not questions that are being asked of people in our studies. So what is the right question? Well, I've already said it. Please tell me about your experience in your own words. 
Very simple. Ethnography 101. Let me end with um, just a story from my own research. So I've, I've been researching the use of psychedelics amongst contemporary pagans, in particular contemporary Druids. I wrote a chapter in 2019. I hoped it was coming out in the first collected anthropology of contemporary Druidry, and it's got hopelessly derailed by COVID, and I don't know if it will ever see the light of day. However, I was speaking to a Druid, not this druid, this is a photo from Google Images of a druid. For those who don't know anything about druidry, it's a modern, neo-pagan, um, land-based spirituality, um, attempting to find religiosity and meaning in the cycles of the, uh, the turning of the year, but also trying to recreate, reimagine, reinvent um, pre-Christian Iron Age religiosity. So it's not about Christianity. Anyway, I'm speaking to this informant, and she's telling me about a high-dose psilocybin experience she had on her own at home. And suddenly, down from the ceiling, you know what's coming down. The it's coming down. And her voice went up in pitch, her head went back, her arms went up, and she said, It was fucking angels! <laughs> The, the expletive was because she was a druid. She didn't want angels. She wanted Neolithic bee shamans or the great earth mother or, you know, the horned gods. And she got angels. These entities came down and they were angels. They were angelic beings. So to me, this was like super interesting. doesn't answer any questions. You know, it may be uh, that she genuinely met some angels, or it may be that she had a Christian upbringing that, and, and that, you know, when you're in dire straits, you reach for the most comforting, or the, mo the thing, the most secure part of your psyche. But it was the surprise of it that I found interesting. One minute to go. Okay. Uh, yeah, we don't need to go into that. So, how are we going to answer the question? Allow informants to speak in their own words. Pay attention to prosody, to nonverbal uh, communication. Look for surprises when it's angels rather than the earth goddess. Look across cultures. How are we ever going to understand psychedelic, psychedelic phenomenology if we don't make this cross-cultural? How are we ever going to extract culture from phenomenology? I don't know. And assemble categories from the evidence rather than enforcing our categories onto the evidence. Thank you so much for listening. Enjoy your session.